farm in your life. The magnificent Perrindales, Corridales, Romneys and Merinos here at Sheep World near Walkworth prove that when it comes to agricultural endeavours, we still lead the world. But while New Zealand has long been proud of its ovine bounty, our ubiquitous multitudes of mutton also serve to remind us of a deeply held fear. A fear that we are in fact not so different to our woolly friends, and that like our sheep, we're a nation of followers, a nation bereft of leaders. Surprisingly few of our leaders have been honoured with public memorials. Perhaps because few have achieved true greatness. There is no state monument to Prime Minister Norm Kirk, but there are three memorial swimming pools. One here in Littleton. One here in Waimati. And one here in Otara. Perhaps our most grandiloquent monument belongs to Sir Michael Joseph Savage. His memorial in Auckland overlooks suburbs dotted with the state houses built by his welfare state. Unfortunately, these now ex-state houses sell for a small fortune and are well beyond the average Kiwi. Many say Savage must spin in his grave at the thought of property sharks and greedy real estate agents getting rich off his beloved state houses. And they'd be right. In fact, thanks to an electromagnetic generator, the former Prime Minister now produces enough electricity to power six state houses and the lights around his memorial. It's hard to know what Mickey Savage would have made of another leader who would benefit from his grand vision of cradle to the grave welfare. He may have begun life in a state house, but by the 1980s, the man in question was living in waterbed luxury. Oh, wait. Oh, I don't know. Let's take it down Calls like this in the middle of the night are commonplace, and they demand that John Key, straight out of a deep sleep, be instantly on the ball. Can you make me make... Yeah, I can, it's fine. Just do it, I think, and... Pick it up the morning. Okay, good man. Thanks, sir. Bye. This documentary was shot just days before the share market crash. It was a heady time when greed was indeed good and John Key was one of the rising stars of this new golden dawn in the moments before it turned into a golden shower. It's almost true to say that, that when the boys arrive in the morning, it's a bit like me throwing raw meat into the, into the pit or the trading room, as we call it, and uh, saying, eat that and then get out there and kill them. Elder's small trading team is rated highly by its competitors for aggression and professionalism, and John Key is its leader. He's the one who tells his colleagues second by second what the price of the Kiwi dollar is and what it will be. Key may have lived the work hard, play hard cliche, but life was not all cocaine and bitches. Indeed, it was quite the opposite. Come on. Good go? Yes, yeah, it's a bad, actually. I don't know, Did you win? Uh, I was lucky in three. <laughs> I don't. Yeah. Though the material rewards of living with a Forex dealer can be great, phone calls in the middle of the night and constant talk about the price of the Kiwi dollar could be a little wearying. But John Key's wife says she's adapted. 
I've taken the time to get to know foreign exchange and understand it a bit more myself because at first I was totally bored because I didn't know anything about it. But now that I understand it more, um, it's more interesting um, and I can put up with him chatting away about it. Though the rewards can be great, the work is intensive. In a field where the only commodity you're trading changes value by the second, it can be a mistake to leave the room. Meal breaks out of the office don't exist, and on those days when things are looking grim, even the most basic human activity is pushed aside. How do you see yourself? Well, obviously it's a, it's a pressure cooker type situation, and um, sometimes when things are going wrong, there is a lot of yelling and screaming. But what lies beneath? Corporate profiler and author John Wareham was brought in to describe the mind of a successful forex dealer. It sounds as though you're describing an obsessional individual. Right. An almost distorted one. An obsessive person, yes, and such individuals are dis dis distorted, yes. They always have a, a problem that they're trying to flee from or cover up. As the central player in this daily drama, John Key relishes making decisions almost faster than the speed of conscious thought. On the trading floor, Key was bold and decisive. But when it came to question time, the answers seemed somewhat elusive. Can you say how many days you would have lost money? I'd prefer not to really, but it's, it's relatively low. Why not? Um, it's probably pretty naughty. <laughs> it's hard to know what Coupe would have made of John Key. He certainly would have been amazed to see Key whizzing about in his BMW. For Coupe, the canoe was the conveyance of choice. But for our modern leaders, the horseless carriage is indispensable. In 1971, that carriage was usually a Chrysler Valiant. Well, here we are, Dr. Finley. We'll start yes. another week for you. It's the usual windy reception. Yes, I'm afraid so. Ten years later, the Ford Fairmont was all the vogue, as was driving with a skinful. I'm going to have another drink and then I'm going to drive home. This is a recreation of the night that Muldoon called the snap election and planned to drive home pissed as a chook. Luckily, Don McKinnon was on hand to let down the tyres of his Sierra Cosworth. Two punctures, Don. In 1990, it was Mike Moore's Mauve Ford Telstar TX5 that hinted at the crushing defeat he was about to face. They're so going to drive to the um, Labour Party headquarters right, in Bishopdale, as I said earlier, and Yvonne's mother's in the back. Looks like she's doing the driving tonight. I wonder if it's normal in that house for the mother in law to go and sit in the car long before um, Mr Moore or Yvonne uh, go to it. But there you see Mike Moore driving on. Away from politics, motor racing was Mr Long's passion, a sport that could accommodate someone his size. Your whole senses uh, accelerate. Your mouth goes dry, your heart down. Whilst it would be unfair and highly inaccurate to refer to Helen Clark as the town bike, it would be fair to say that she got around using this contraption. It's a Honda 50 step through and it's on display here at Auckland's Museum of Transport and Technology. And just as Helen loved her Japanese bike, the Japanese loved Helen. So much so that she was even honoured with her own TV special. I actually don't use the towel rail, heated rail, anymore at all. Just what the Japanese were actually laughing about is hard to fathom. But there's no doubt that our premiere brings them much enjoyment. Mm. 
カメラにぶつからないよ。Which scarred him at a young age, Robert Muldoon was destined to leave his own mark on the country. First, as an economic whiz kid in the Holyoke cabinet, and he's misleading you again. That figure's correct. Leaving old Keith to do what he did best. Good evening, sir. And now that look as stately as a moorpork, and hoot. Nice things in BBCs. What has happened to that? Well, it's naturally one of great pleasure and um, gratitude to people of New Zealand who've recognised, obviously, the worth of our government. Now let's let's make it perfectly clear. Muldoon had a great self-confidence, surety of action, and a style that said, "I know what I'm doing, peasant. Trust me." He says at the back, about time too. He staged a coup during a pause in one of Jack Marshall's sentences. Made a more aggressive approach uh, seems uh, to be called for by. Uh, and it was over by before he whistled his last S. A significant and uh, perhaps a, a majority of uh, our supporters. And when his only capable opponent, Norman Kirk, died. He let loose the dogs of Hustings. Muldoon's time had come, and he swept through the nation as nothing less than our rightful ruler in waiting, just minus the toga. These were imperial and impressive occasions. A master of conflict, he shone most brightly when challenged. Do you play against anyone anywhere? Hecklers were as fish in his barrel. This government's not going to interfere. We're not going to have clowns like that interrupting us. Take that warning right out. Yeah, you better. <laughs> you're not going to like this answer. I can see that. Get someone to shout your trip to after them. You'll get a job. But my guess is that you'll be scared sick at the sight of it. Down the back, unrepentant. Good on you. That's loyalty. Not all that bright, but it's loyal. I. Admired him as a performer. I mean, he was he was fluent. He was powerful. Um, he was he was probably the greatest political performer of my political life. Such was his popularity. The populace felt strangely compelled to fashion his likeness, in everything from money boxes to perplexingly margarine. He frequently received impromptu gifts from a grateful and gushing citizenry. It's even got a little end card in it. <laughs> Rob thrilled them with his common touch and frequently cracked one in public <laughs> as he looked out on his dominion beyond the statue of Augustus Caesar. The common man's champion was captured on film being distinctly common. Anybody who's lived in this country, been brought up in this country, is a, is a man in the street. I know him because I'm one of them. Relaxing in his batch at Hatfield's Beach in frighteningly relaxing shirts, which matched the upholstery. But surrounded by minions on his side of the house... You know, personally, I support him and that's it. I wouldn't be in his cabinet. But... His rule became increasingly autocratic and abrasive. You tell me who they are and I'll have a talk to them. <laughs> he once said, once I really poured into him once at a dinner party at my place, and, and he told somebody afterwards how much he enjoyed the objecting to what he had said because he doesn't get it in cabinet anymore. He was famously frosty on frost. This, this, this so-called sergeant major that would have been tossed out of my unit. And dictatorial 
even while in a box. I will not, I will not have some smart Alec interviewer changing the rules of the game halfway through, Mr. Walker. If he didn't like what a journalist was writing, he discovered that he could have them sent to the dungeons. We haven't done very much in cabinet this morning, that is. No, Mr. Scott. Sorry. Come into my staff here. Take him away, will you? Tom Scott wrote such penetrating satire about the Muldoon administration, he was banned from Beehive press conferences and from travelling abroad with the PM. Well, there's a Chinese proverb that says one rat's dropping spoils a whole bowl of soup. And, uh... He was in bed the first time I saw him, which was in Bowen Hospital having a, a tendon operation on his hand, so he was in this bed with all this surrounded by this sort of snowy white starched bed linen and in the middle of it it was like finding something really nasty in the middle of a pavlova that shouldn't be there you know there was a slap <coughs> and his hand was dangling from a sling sort of in the ceiling and really the you know quotes i got were mainly <coughs> um and i sort of dutifully wrote them down i was absolutely terrified but um he sort of i think he identified me as you know exactly the sort of journalist he liked which was you know someone who would write down exactly what he said. There's no doubt that Muldoon left his mark. From Think Big came the destruction of Cromwell, which made way for the Muldoon Dam, which featured himself alongside Ramses the Great and the other broken up one. His descent into economic madness was complete with the ill-fated Mechanomics and his proposal to hand out $100 to one randomly selected citizen each week. The Springbok tour helped him to retain power in 1981. But then, in 1984, with terrified minions in tow, there came a miscalculated and drunken announcement of a snap election. The dice was thrown. And the game was at long last lost. <laughs> Deposed by defeat, he rattled around the back benches, increasingly out of touch and irrelevant. Now declawed, it was finally safe to approach and pat the great tiger on his last day at the zoo. There's nobody here, look at that. There's some... Um... Well, it's a great farewell party. There's not. <laughs> Thereafter, he amused himself with radio and theatre. He was typecast as himself in Terry and the Gunrunners. Yes, yes, I know all about that bit. Now, what's he up to? But strangely, <laughs> although many people made a fair dollar impersonating his chuckle, <laughs> he could never impersonate it himself. Sweet dreams. <laughs> Branch of Northern Beach, Piggy Muldoon would relax, disarmed for a moment in the company of his wife and family. And therein there is no doubt of the one great good which he brought to office. And her name was Thea. Traditionally, it's been the job of the First Lady to stand by her man and keep her mouth shut. Thea Muldoon set the standard as the patient and loyal wife of Prime Minister Rob Muldoon. She sees her role quite clearly. More or less a supportive one. If we go to a factory, I talk to the people at the factory, just the same as Bob does. I make sure his clothes are ready. I take a traveling iron and press them in between places so everything is just ready. Things are ready after a press conference just to step into. So off you go to the meeting. So you have to, you have to think of the Prime Minister's wardrobe as well as everything That's else. That's right, yes. It was important for the First Lady to appear as normal as any other Kiwi housewife. I've always just supported him, but I've certainly had no ambitions for myself at all. I just prefer to stay at home and keep the household running smoothly. Unlike American First Ladies, ours were judged not by the state of their clothes, 
but by the state of their clothes lines. It's very easy to get um, depressed about the whole thing um, because you're really trying to cope, um, firstly, with bringing up the children, secondly, with a husband that's um, not here when you think he should be here kind of business um, when things go wrong, and um, you just get bogged down with it. David Longy's wife, Naomi, was no glamour puss. She shopped at Three Guys like any other pleb, rubbing shoulders and swapping coupons with the great unhosed. She is the one who fronts up to the people who are themselves in the front line. She is the one who's telephoned, she is grabbed in the supermarket. She gets it from people who in some funny way feel they can't get to me. Are you living here? From the bottom of my heart, I mean that, yes. Okay, I mean thank that. you. He's doing a wonderful job for us poor people. Thank you. Wait till the budget comes out. <laughs> For all their faults, those who lead us deserve at least passing thanks. For they're often subject to ridicule and brown eyes. Although, unlike these simple creatures, our leaders are usually spared the indignity of having their throats split and their carcasses thrown on a pile. In this, our Aotearoa land of leaders.